Hi, I'm Daryl Suskin. I am a food scientist, and I don't know why, but tonight I'm going to talk to you about making plutonium out of common household items. Are you aware you're all now on a watch list? <laughs> <laughs> all at <right>, once. <laughs> So, of course, you're wondering, why in the world would I be talking about that? Um, really, there's no good reason. Um, I thought it might make an interesting Nerd Night topic. I actually watched a bunch of YouTubes, and there were surprisingly crazier things than making plutonium. Um, I remember one about Sasquatch, another about uh, libraries. I mean... <laughs> So, what was I thinking? Well, back when I was in uh, grade school, there was a movie called UHF, and in it was this scene. I, I apologize for the choppiness, but it's kind of long and slow. My name but is Philo, and welcome to... Secrets of, of, of the universe. Today, we're going to learn to make plutonium from common household items. <laughs> so that's the scene in the movie. And my 13-year-old self thought it was like the funniest thing in the world. And fast forward to a couple years ago, and I read a book called The Radioactive Boy Scout by Ken Silverstein. It's about David Hahn, who was uh, an Eagle Scout, and he was just kind of obsessed with chemistry and radiation and all this other, I don't know, nerd night type stuff, I guess. And uh, his Bible was the Golden Book of Chemistry Experiments. Um, it was a book from the 60s that his dad gave to him, and it goes over you know, a bunch of different experiments. Uh, they were probably much more dangerous than what would be allowed today, but back then they didn't really have lawyers going over everything. So you know, they had some dangerous experiments in there, and he kind of learned all about chemistry. In fact, uh, when his chemistry teacher was out and they had a substitute, he would actually teach the class. So he was just kind of very obsessed with chemistry and nuclear stuff. Um, kind of a strange kid, but um, he, he kind of wanted to solve the world's energy problems. You know, that's... For a high schooler, the only logical way would be to build a breeder reactor in your garden shed, apparently, because that's what he went about doing. So how did he go about doing this? Well, he mainly did just tons of research. I mean, way more than even like a, a, a college person would do. Um, sorry about the train. <laughs> he, he read a lot of books. He, um, he actually posed as a professor when, uh, you know, he couldn't, you know, hit a stumbling block or whatever. He would call up, you know, like the nuclear commission and ask him all sorts of questions as though he was a professor. And I don't think they really believed he was a professor, but they probably figured he was harmless. He would write letters to, you know, different companies and whatnot, trying to find out information about you know, nuclear reactors and, and whatnot, and I don't know. <laughs> he had all sorts of misspellings in, in these things. I don't think they believed he was really a professor, but, you know, they humored him. And uh, the most important thing for building a breeder reactor in your garden shed is to just kind of ignore all the risks. He, he read all this research, and, you know, any time it would say, you know, radiation can cause cancer and it can kill you, he just kind of, eh, I'll push it to the side. That's not important. You know, the important thing is to build a breeder reactor and solve all the world's energy problems. So the way he uh, ended up figuring out how to build this reactor, you know, he had a lot of stumbling blocks that kind of led to dead ends, is he realized he could take thorium and 
shine, well not shine, but point neutrons at it and that would turn into uranium which would then breed more neutrons and breed even more um, uranium and you kind of end up with more energy than what you start with. So he took lith er, thorium from these old camping lanterns, the filament in there is thorium oxide and he stripped the lithium out of lithium batteries and kind of mixed it with the thorium. I'm not quite sure how it worked, but it pulls the oxygen off, turns into lithium oxide, and you end up with pure thorium. So, I don't know. It, it makes it much more radioactive, so don't try that at home. <laughs> and for the, the neutron source that he needed, um, he had a source of alpha particles, which I'll discuss later in the presentation, and he used a sheet of aluminum foil, and uh, it's not really important how this works, I'll talk about it later, but you know, you shine alpha particles at the aluminum foil and you end up with neutrons coming out the other end. So he just kind of pointed the, the neutrons at the thorium. The thorium turns into protactinium, which then turns into uranium-233, which can then be used to breed more uh, energy, which is kind of what his goal was. So he had this thing going for a couple weeks, just kind of sitting there doing its thing. You know, once it's pointed at your uh, thorium source, you just kind of leave it alone, and there's really not much else to do. Um, he actually had a Geiger counter. Not many high school kids have one, but that measures radiation levels. He noticed the, the levels kind of getting higher and higher, and it finally started to worry him a little bit, and he started acting all kind of suspicious, and uh, one night it was like three in the morning, I'm not quite sure what he was doing, but a uh, police car pulled him over, probably because he was acting all suspicious, and he actually fessed up to what he was doing in his uh, garden shed, and <laughs> they, they ended up arresting him, but they had no idea if they could even charge him with anything, and they had no clue what was going on, you know, was he a terrorist, what was he? And he was just explaining, oh, I'm trying to, you know, solve the world's energy problems. <laughs> you know, like any high school kid. <laughs> So eventually the EPA comes in and you know they start measuring radiation levels and they they consider that shed a uh, what's called a superfund site which is reserved for like highly contaminated chemical spills and you know nuclear <laughs> you know, spills, that sort of thing. And they came in, you know, with their radiation suits everywhere and they cleaned it up. And the, the strangest thing I find about this whole story is there was just very little media attention. Um, very few people heard about it outside, uh, I think he lived in Michigan somewhere. And uh, this was in the mid 90s too, I think right before the OJ Simpson trial. Um, I don't know, maybe that had something to do with it. So, in 1999, uh, the University of Chicago, every year they have uh, a scavenger hunt, and on it they have all sorts of crazy different things. They're all worth different points based on the difficulty of coming up with whatever it is they're looking for. Well, one of the, the items was a breeder reactor in a shed, and that was worth the most amount of points. No one really thought anyone would do it, but you know, this is the University of Chicago. Obviously, some people will do it. So Justin Casper and Fred Neal decided to build one. <laughs> Tell him I mentioned him in this, okay? <laughs> Well, anyway, they, they decided to build one from parts in a physics lab, and <laughs> they were actually able to measure trace amounts of plutonium. Um, they weren't using thorium. They were using uranium, irradiating it to make plutonium. But it's still a breeder reactor, just slightly different. And because they were able to measure some plutonium, they actually got the points for that item. And even though that was by far worth the most amount of points, I don't think they actually won that year, which is really too bad. <laughs> so moving on, um, 
How does one actually make plutonium? Well, first you need a uranium source, and then you irradiate it with neutrons, and the uranium absorbs the neutron, and it turns into neptunium, which then kind of spontaneously turns into plutonium. So really, after steps one and two, you just kind of wait, and it does itself. So to make plutonium, it's pretty easy. Now, if you want to make it with household items, um, <laughs> in the movie UHF, he, he, there's a deleted scene where he actually says, well, it, it, I guess the scene was just taking way too long, so they had to cut it. But he was saying you need uh, a car battery, um, and one of those hand crank egg beaters, and a big bowl of jello, and you microwave it for two days, and you run. <laughs> <laughs> He was pretty close, but here's what you actually need. Uh, as many smoke detectors as possible, um, a pair of, uh, high, well, doesn't matter, just some high-end speakers. Um, I think the next talk is actually going to be talking about that. Um, a cast iron frying pan. Um, Why hmm? Why I'll, I'll explain that later. <laughs> uh, one of those creme brulee torches, you know, that you get at uh, Bed Bath & Beyond. Uh, some of your grandma's green and yellow depression glass. Uh, some household lye, which is just uh, sodium hydroxide. Uh, let's see, what else do you need? A uh, ceramic dish and a metal can. That's, that's really all you need to make plutonium. But here's some recommended items. They aren't really household. <laughs> Obviously, you would want a radiation suit, uh, your own radiation lab, a degree in nuclear chemistry or engineering and chemical engineering, and also some experience in the related field would be highly recommended. So in other words, just don't try this, seriously. <laughs> so what you want to do is get your uranium. <laughs> First thing you got to do is put grandma in a home. <laughs> and, you know, grandmas tend to have a lot of depression glass, so you take her yellow and green depression glass. That's the important part because the yellow and green can have up to 25% uranium in it, which is what you need. So you, um, after she's in the home and she's not, you know, looking around at you stealing her glass, you break it up into pieces and you uh, take your household lye, you want to melt it in the can using your creme brulee torch. Uh, I guess lye melts at 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Hey, Danielle, how many is that in degrees Kelvin? <laughs> she hates when people say degrees Kelvin. Because <laughs> it's just Kelvin. Anyway. You uh, add the glass into the liquefied lye, and it dissolves. And uh, you end up with the uranium that settles to the bottom. Uh, I haven't actually tried this. I'm not sure if anybody has, but just take my word for it. I think it works. Um, maybe a chemist would know better. But anyway, that's how you get the uranium. So the next step is you need a neutron source. So here's kind of an overview of how the, you know, the big guys get their neutrons. They have a source of alpha particles. They have a beryllium plate. And you shoot the alpha particles through it. Um, you've got the beryllium and the alpha particle, which is a helium atom, turns into carbon. It makes one neutron and one gamma ray. And since we're ignoring all the risks, just ignore that gamma ray. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so that's the way to make one in general. So first, to make a beryllium plate, you rip open that uh, high-end speaker. The high-end speakers have beryllium in it. Uh, lower end, don't use that metal. I guess it's kind of expensive. So you melt it on your cast iron pan. Iron melts at 2800F Fahrenheit. I'm, I'm not sure how much Kelvin that is. The torch gets to 2600, and beryllium melts at 2150. So you'll actually melt the beryllium and not melt your pan, which is perfect. And 
really, you don't even need beryllium. You could use aluminum foil if you don't want to destroy a high-end pair of speakers, but it's just not nearly as efficient as beryllium is. So the next step is you need an alpha particle source. Well, what you do then is just get a whole bunch of smoke detectors. Um, you open up the part that says, warning, radioactive material. <laughs> Return to supplier or health department for proper disposal. <laughs> Ignore that, rip that open, and with your tweezers, there's going to be about a microgram of americium in it, which is a great alpha particle emitter. Now, smoke detectors work by um, alpha particles just kind of blazing across to a sensor, and the smallest thing will interrupt an alpha particle, like a smoke particle, and if it's interrupted, the alarm goes off. So that's just kind of how they work. But anyway, you pull out your microgram, and you repeat that with as many smoke detectors as you can get. So the next step is you just kind of want to melt them all together. So put them in your ceramic dish. The americium melts at 2350. Um, your ceramic dish shouldn't melt. I mean, you get the high uh, temperature stuff. And then all you do is put the americium ball that you kind of melted and put it behind the beryllium plate, and you've got your neutron source. <laughs> so <laughs> next, you just point and shoot. Uh, you can, you know, the longer you, you point and shoot, the, the more you get. And you just kind of have to wait. Um, I'm not sure if you guys understand half-life, but uh, like the uranium absorbs a neutron. Um, most uranium is 238. That's the atomic weight of it. It hits, absorbs a neutron, turns into uranium 239. Um, that has a half-life of about 23 minutes, which means if you had a pile of uranium-239, in 23 minutes you would have half of that left. Another 23 minutes you'd have a quarter of it left. But uh, after, um, it, it then changes into neptunium-239, and that has a two-and-a-half-day uh, half-life, so you kind of got to wait a while. Um, you know, that's why I got the, the poor old dog and the, the cat waiting. <laughs> Then uh, the neptunium turns into plutonium, and the longer you point the neutrons at the uh, uranium, the more uh, plutonium you end up with. So, fifth step, the radiation levels are going to get higher and higher. Um, neutrons tend to irradiate other materials by making them radioactive, and you're not really directing the neutrons in one general direction, so other things are going to cause, you know, high levels of radiation. So run, call 911, and if you're lucky, maybe they'll call it a Superfund site. <laughs> and I was trying to figure out a way to actually separate the plutonium from the uranium using household items. And the more I looked, the more I realized it's not easy to do. Um, there might be a way. I'm not a chemist. I'm just a food scientist. So. You really can't do much with this other than it's kind of a, a proof of concept and there's really no way to make it into a, like a nuclear weapon. You need at least 10 kilograms of plutonium to do that. Um, that and you need to know how to make explosive lenses, uh, a neutron trigger and just all sorts of other things working together. Um, I could probably give a talk about that, but I won't. <laughs> um, just repeat this five to 10 billion times, you can get your uh, 10 kilograms of plutonium and if you manage to succeed with that, then uh, uh, it kind of stopped here. Not sure, oh. There we go. Then kaboom. <laughs> so that's pretty much how to make plutonium out of common household items. Uh, <laughs> and I'm open to any questions you guys have. <laughs> yes. Whoa. Oh. oh. Uh, I guess you need the microphone. Why was the Depression era glass so high in uranium? Um, that's just kind of the pigment they used. I'm, I'm not quite sure, but apparently it kind of glows.
green and yellow, um, the uranium salts, I guess, make that color. So that's why they used it. Uranium isn't very radioactive. It's got a half-life of about four and a half billion years. So from when the Earth was made, um, about half of it is left. Which, um, so it, it's not like if you're handling it, you'll become radioactive or anything. Unless some nerd, whoa, Tom. Unless some nerd is making more of it. <laughs> a few billion nerds. <laughs> Other questions? Well, I've got a question. <laughs> uh, whatever happened to David Hahn? Um, he's the radioactive Boy Scout. Um, I figured somebody would ask, but apparently not. Um, it, it's kind of sad, actually. I thought he would actually go on to bigger and better things, but um, he ended up, uh, after he dismantled it, he went through a lot of depression, didn't really know what to do, took some college classes. Uh, his dad kind of told him, you know, join the Navy, become something. So he joined the Navy on a nuclear sub, and you'd think that would be great for him, except the, the people on the sub heard his story, and they wouldn't let him any near, anywhere near the reactor. And <laughs> I think he ended up dropping out and um, he's gotten uh, arrested. It, it, it's sad. I thought he would really, you know, become something because he, he, he had so much potential. He was just very, you know, single-minded. So, uh, any other questions at all? <laughs> uh, the question is, did he have any other side effects from radiation poisoning? And there's actually a good answer to that. Um, he refused to be tested because if you're tested and you have more than a certain amount, you can't work anywhere near radiation, and he didn't want to know. So that kind of, I guess, leaves him open to perhaps maybe some future research if he ever gets his act in order. Anything else? <laughs> All right, well... I will leave you guys with this clip from UHF that has nothing Today, to do with Today, one of these lucky the contestants will win his or her weight in fish right here on Wheel of Fish. It's kind of a cross between uh, okay, Wheel of Fortune let's play the game. and uh, Let's Make a Deal. We start with yesterday's winner, Miss Phyllis Weaver. Are you ready, Weaver? I sure am, Cooney. Okay, you get over there and spin the wheel of fish. Go ahead, give it a big spin. A red snapper. Mmm, very tasty. Okay, Weaver, listen carefully. You can hold on to your uh, red snapper, or you can go for what's in the box that Hiro-san is bringing down the aisle right now! What's it gonna be? Don't take the box. Don't take the box. Nothing! Absolutely nothing! Stupid! You're so stupid! All right, thank you. <laughs> very nice. Thank you very much. Uh, just a note from Schmitty, who is a lawyer. Uh, you will not go home and do any of those things. Please, please, please. Thanks very much. Um, <laughs> all right, so we'll put a few minutes on the clock. Go grab yourself some more drinks. Um, oh, wait. I need your, I need your opinion up here, Daryl. I'm sorry to let you go and then bring you back. Because we had several good entrants. <laughs> uh, so your options for better alternate talks, okay. uh, talk titles, better living through chemistry, breaking bad protons. <laughs> And 
life in 2015 without hoverboards or Mr. Fusion, how to get plutonium without pissing off the Libyans. <laughs> Wait, did I miss any? How to steal from Nana, fake credentials, and create fire hazards to make plutonium. <laughs> Alternate title, terrible excuses to put grandma in a home, chapter one. <laughs> The Making of Radioactive Man. Some people are entering many times, but they're very funny. How to become a supervillain in three easy steps. <laughs> Final entry, Nuclear Anomaly. Your call. I'm gonna go with the, I'm gonna go with the uh, bad reasons for putting grandma in a home. <laughs> Rich Cole, a drink on us. Thank you very much.